in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is the CEO of the Ethics and Compliance Initiative, Dr. Pat Harnett. Doc, thank you for being with us today. It's great to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I am thrilled to have you on, and I am thrilled that you have a Socrates statue in the background. I told you before, show we're going to get along just fine. Let's just real quick, maybe take this conversation down into its elements. How do you define ethics and how do you define compliance in your context? Great question. I think people hear those terms all the time in their workplace. Very simply stated, ethics has to do with what the right thing is to do, how you should behave in your workplace or in your life more broadly. Compliance is really about when you're overstepping, what you should not do, how your behaviors break the law. And that's why they're usually paired together. Mm, Okay. So what you shouldn't do to break the law. Now, where does integrity uh, play its role in this? Integrity is often, at least as I've seen it in a lot of workplaces, companies will use ethics and and integrity interchangeably. But if you were going to ask my friend Socrates, who is over my shoulder, or even Baby Yoda on the other side of me, um, they would say that integrity is actually, it's a character trait. It's a value that you have. And integrity is the act of living out your values consistently. So we say somebody has integrity when They're generally a good person when they're demonstrating all kinds of values that we admire about them. But you see it in a lot of codes of conduct. You see a lot of people with integrity in their titles because often that term gets translated more easily all around the world. Mm, Right. So where, where does that term get blurry, both domestically and around the world? Well, certainly in companies that have global ethics and compliance programs, they'll often use the term integrity because the term ethics can be misconstrued in different countries and different languages. Um, Honestly, the places where I think it starts to get blurry or messy is when people actually don't act with integrity. (laughs) But for the most part, Um, You know, whether an organization is using either term, I think it works because most people would agree that they care about ethics in the workplace or they care about having integrity in what they do. Is there a common value in an organization that tends to be the values that work when it comes to not breaking the law? You know, it's interesting if you do surveys, our, our organization does surveys every now and then of employees and companies to ask them what do they think the values are that their company should have. And a few almost always rise to the surface. Integrity is actually one of them. Uh, honesty, respect is a very big one. Uh, responsibility and, and excellence is another one that is usually frequently cited. So It's kind of interesting. We all come from different walks of life and have different perspectives. But when you ask us, how do you want to be treated in the workplace or how would you like to treat others? Those are the values that are generally universal. When it comes to prevention and trying to prevent someone from being unethical for not being in compliance with the law, what needs to be said in advance from a leader in a position or the employees in the position to make sure they prevent something like this from happening? Well, tone at the top is huge. And, and frankly, when you look at how do you promote integrity in the workplace, it's there are two major drivers of it. The senior leadership, your CEO, the C-suite leaders, but also people who are in a position of management, immediate supervisors. So if those folks are talking about the values of the organization and how they factor into their decision making, if they're talking about the code of conduct that the company has or the importance of um, success, successful business means we do our work while observing the law or we have we observe integrity in what we do. Those are the things that set the right tone and those are the things that have to be said before pretty much everything else. It, it has to be a part of daily conversation. ECI is one of the oldest or long-lasted 
uh, ethics and compliance uh, program nonprofit out there. How has how has the definitions changed over the years, and how do you can see it? How do you continue to see it change throughout something like COVID when people are working remotely more often? So our organization has been around since 1922. And while there are days that I feel like I was there at the beginning or I might look like I was the founder, I'm not. Um, but it is interesting, the history of our work, how much it's changed over the years. And at the end of the day, it's really not that the, the emphasis or the talk has changed. The goal has not changed. The goal is to create workplaces where good people come to work and make good decisions. They're able to live out their values and feel like they have been successful without compromising their standards or the company's standards. But what has changed over the years is the complexity of the laws that companies have to comply with, the complexity of the systems they have to have in place, especially as their companies grow and have a, a larger footprint. So um, while the basics are the same, in the, at least as long as I've been with this organization, I would say all of the different factors and different moving parts of an ethics and compliance program is vastly different. And an interesting thing that you said there was when, you know, the, the, the goal hasn't changed when people get up and go to work, it's gotta be a, a nice, safe, you know, culture, except people aren't going to work now. A lot of people are staying mm -hmm. at home and people want to be themselves at home. They want their home to be a comfortable, safe environment, as well as, you know, environment that they can work on and be flexible mm -hmm. in. Like how, how are you responsible now as a business owner for what your employees do in their own home? Well, the lines are definitely getting blurred a whole lot more. Um, and we have started to see in at least the surveys our center has done of employees around the world, people's relationships are changing. The way we work together is changing. I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know because we're all experiencing it. But, and it is also the case that companies, as long as you're doing their work, you are employed and the activities you're engaged in have to do with that company, they are responsible for your behavior. So it's getting a little bit blurry now that kids run around in the background and Parents are part-time teachers, um, and I think a lot of companies are trying to think that through, especially if they're going to stay at home or they're going to have modified operations and allow people to work from home. Those lines are getting a little bit blurry. It's interesting because when I think of compliance and from like my lens, I think of like conformity. Like I think of I have to comply with everything that's going on and I can't be myself in an organization it might be a generational thing. It might not be. Uh, how do you see the the next generation? Like, I guess maybe you just had a big uh, survey. You had big yeah. results. What did you see from different generations or the amount of time people have been in the workforce? The next generation is is having a huge influence on the way companies are working and in the way that they are trying to communicate with their employees. And frankly a lot of the emphasis that companies are now placing on being environmentally and socially responsible and in terms of their governance, it's being driven by a generation of both employees and consumers who care a whole lot more about whether or not companies are actually doing good in the world. And that's driving a whole new emphasis. It's a great thing to see. Um, when we have surveyed different generations, one thing we know is that the less time you've spent in the workplace, I won't go by age, but you know, younger generations coming into the workplace are much more interested in being engaged with each other, giving feedback to the company, having a say in company values and the cultures. Um, the longer you've been in the workplace, the more you're probably likely to be a little more cynical and be much more focused on the stuff you were talking about, Kevin, compliance and the rules and are we enforcing the rules? So it's really interesting to see that shift happening. Now, elaborate on that a little bit more in terms of the next generation, how they respond to compliance, how they respond to someone telling them, hey, you can't act the way you normally act as a human being? Well, it, 
They respond well. I mean, I think if anything, this next generation, the generation that's coming up into leadership now, they're deeply concerned about um, how their companies are succeeding. And they're very committed to making sure that they're not overstepping and not breaking the law in what they're doing. But the way companies are communicating all of that isn't exactly hitting home with them. So um, things like the traditional compliance training where you take an online course about conflicts of interest, not exactly the most compelling thing for a lot of people, but even more so for this next generation and the folks who are actually taking on management roles now. So again, it's about their being engaged, they're being able to talk to each other, being able to discuss situations that are happening and reason through how can we do better? How can we change this workplace and, and improve and strengthen it? So if anything, I think this, this new generation of leadership is really very good for the kinds of cultures we're trying to create. Ethics and compliance people, which is the community that my organization tends to work with, we we like that because what we want is to allow people to live out their values and, and new leaders coming up are really committed to that. So are you encouraging like just healthy discussions around this topic? Obviously instilling integrity, responsibility, these great values into people is quite difficult. What would you re recommend for an organization to encourage a culture like that? Absolutely. Uh, most companies, they do have, pretty significant obligations to show that they've trained 100% of their workforce on certain topics based on their key risk areas. And that's why things like e-learning and um, some of the train, you know, you go into a room and you might watch a video or listen to a speaker. That's why those programs continue to happen. But by far the most effective thing when it comes to talking about values and dealing with problems in the workplace. It's a conversation where a manager sits down with his or her direct reports and they talk about situations that have happened in the workplace. They talk about how real is this problem for us? What do we do when this problem happens? And, and even perhaps most importantly, if you observe some kind of wrongdoing when you're at work uh, or working from home at work, how do you go about trying to resolve that? And what happens if you come forward to report it? Mm, okay. Okay. And uh, doc, there's probably a lot of uh, business owners or leaders listening to this right now. Like, Oh geez, like I don't have my values ironed out. Uh, I don't haven't even thought about things like this. And Jesus is, is my culture going to self-destruct? Like what are, what are some indicators that leaders listening to this can pick up on or notice that would indicate to them that their culture is in dire need of change? So some of the most important things that if you've never done a survey of your employees about your culture, there are a couple of questions that are really critical to ask your employees. And it doesn't have to be a big, huge survey effort. It could even be focus groups or as you're out and about talking to employees, ask them these questions. The first is, do you ever feel pressure to compromise our standards or to break the law in order to do your job? People are surprisingly willing to say yes to that question if they feel it. And if they do, there is an extremely high likelihood that misconduct is happening somewhere in your organization. Because when people say, I feel pressure to have to break the rules, it means that somewhere out there, people are breaking the rules. Um, the other one that is really critical to ask is when people tell you that they've reported wrongdoing and the way to get at this, every, most companies now have some means of helpline, hotline, website where you can report suspected misconduct, follow up with those people and ask them, did you experience any kind of retaliation for coming forward? And if they say yes to that question, that is an indicator that your culture is probably starting to erode because when retaliation happens, the first thing is those people that came forward to report to you, they're not gonna tell you retaliation happens. You know, They're not gonna report it like an act of misconduct. But if anybody else comes to them and says, hey, I'm seeing something, what do you think I should do? They're going to tell their colleagues, don't bother to report it because you're only gonna get punished. So pressure, and when people are reporting, ask them about their experience. Are they experiencing retaliation for having done so? 
And I'm sad to say that we just finished doing this big study where we we measure trends around the world in workplaces. And those are two of the questions we ask about. Both of those numbers are exponentially higher than they have ever been before. Um, and that's what gives us some worry that in this COVID environment, as people are enduring lots of pressures and lots of changes, it's going to affect the cultures of our workplaces and not in a good way. So does ECI go into these organizations and do these surveys or is it coming from like the manager of an organization? Because I, I feel like that might be a little counterintuitive if I were to do a survey for people I'm overseeing just because they may not be completely honest with. Sure. It happens I mean. in, yeah, it happens in a couple of different ways. ECI does do that. That is something that um, we're a nonprofit organization. We do research. We have a membership community, but it is one of the ways that we are funded as a small nonprofit. We help companies to do culture assessments and to look at, to field surveys of employees, look at how people are doing. But there are plenty of organizations out there that'll do it. That said, if, if you're not working for a big company or you have a small budget, managers actually can sit down with their employees and ask some of these questions, or you can integrate it into an engagement survey, a couple of questions about reporting and about pressure and have you observed any kind of wrongdoing, and you'll be surprised how many people are willing to answer those questions. Interesting. interesting. Now, did you see like a, an uptick in risk-taking ability, <laughs> risk risk taking uh during covid when people are saying you know hey jobs on the line i've got to make an extra couple dollars today what what changed maybe in your results during the pandemic and the lockdown so some of the things we saw this time we've seen in past changes in the economy and it's usually when the economy starts to take a downturn um, we start to see people saying they're feeling more pressure they're feeling more pressure to break rules but they're feeling performance pressure um, companies tend to not take as many business risks. And so employees are not necessarily taking business risks in what they're doing um, because they want to save their jobs. They don't want to risk their jobs. And Frank and companies are trying to just weather the storm, if you will. So um, some things do go up like pressure or like retaliation, reporting, people's willingness to report wrongdoing, but business risk tends to be a little more conservative during those times. Mm, okay. Interesting. I was also interested to learn about the psychology behind cultures and what works. Uh, what is emotional intelligence's role? Understanding your, your team members, understanding and empathizing with other individuals, how does that play or affect a strong culture? Well, at the end of the day, we're all relational people. I mean, we go to our jobs and we want to succeed in our careers and in our professions, but a big part of our workplace is how we're connecting to other people. And, and EQ has, has a big part to play in all of that. And that's why when you walk into an organization to try to help them change their culture, change them, strengthen their culture, one of the first things you do is you start to teach managers how to talk to people, how to listen to people, how to invite them to ask questions or raise different opinions, um, because that's the beginning of helping people to feel comfortable raising concerns or reporting suspected wrongdoing. A big part of culture is feeling valued by your employer and the best way for that to be conveyed to people is when leaders simply take an interest in the people that are working for them mm -hmm. um, and of course we're all wired really differently some people are in introverts and are super you know kind of cognitive people others are very emotional people that the trick is to make the effort to reach out to them, to try to be communicating with employees in different ways so that they're feeling heard and they feel like they have an opportunity to have input and they hear that the company's telling them they, they value them. I got it. It's, it's interesting. What comes to my head next is this movement of mindfulness and mm -hmm being able to regulate your emotions like you said the emotional people are maybe responding to something that's on their on their mind or something that just happened and they get emotionally hijacked by their amygdala um, amygdala excuse me 
have you done any research on mindfulness in the workplace or with leaders incorporating mindfulness, deep breathing, meditation, any types of meditation within the workplace? And have you seen any proven results? That's not an area that ECI has looked into, but I have seen other research studies that have looked into that. In fact, I'm reading a book right now about mindsets and mindfulness. And, and the research is pretty clear that the more people are practicing mindfulness, what it does for them is it helps them to feel grounded. It helps them to center on what it is that's most important to them. It helps them to solve problems better. It helps them to relate to each other better. Um, and certainly we see all the time that all the kinds of conflicts that happen in the workplace, half the time it's because we're stressed, we're tired, we're feeling pressure, you know, and there's just so much going on around us that it's really hard to stay focused. And that's where mindfulness is really a helpful exercise. There are a lot of companies that are actually either providing to their employees access to apps that help them to practice mindfulness or they're, they're hosting sessions for their employees. And they find that it helps them to just feel much more grounded and much, and frankly, they feel more supported because their company cares about that for them. How do you see, I just want to acknowledge your answer very quick. I mean, I, I think that's, it's very interesting, uh, very interesting points. And, and I wish that there was some research that you all had uh, maybe <laughs> had done because I, I just hear from so many business owners that come on the show like uh, who actually practice meditation. Mm. Uh, and we had Daniel Goleman, the author of EQ on, and he was saying, you know, getting, getting emotionally hijacked is just human nature. It's, it mm -hmm. happens to everybody. And if you're able to, you know, control your mind and realize when it wanders off and comes back, you're strengthening that muscle every single time. So in a culture, when something like, you know, un that's unfortunate or sets you off, you've got to have that mental strength to, to bring you right back. It's a great suggestion. So check back with me in about six to eight months. Our, some of our researchers are patched in now. They're probably scribbling notes. We need to look into that because it's a great idea. I, I also think, you know, the flip side of that, there's also a lot of research around the kinds of people who end up being the really big wrongdoers in a workplace, you know, the ones who are you know, committing financial fraud or sexually harassing employees and those kinds of things. And, and I, there's also a psychopathy there too. Um, so it is all really connected. And that, that's something that would be really interesting to look into. Interesting. Interesting. Now, what about like, I don't know, like AI, how is AI um, that maybe is taking over jobs, making jobs easier, Emotional intelligence may become some type of premium, being able to understand people versus this intelligence that's uh, kind of automating everything. Uh, just throwing it out there. Have you done any research? Yeah, on AI? It's, I would say it's the wild west of the ethics and compliance profession right. because what's hard about it is there are actually ethics questions and decisions that you have to program into artificial intelligence because humans are not actually... I mean, you have to have checks and balances. There, there's an ethics issue to artificial intelligence. Um, but what I think it's doing for the rest of us in our workplaces, increasingly you read all kinds of stories about how in you know a decade, certain jobs won't exist anymore because they will have been replaced by either artificial intelligence or some other kind of machine learning. So I think our world is changing so fast. And that is what for a lot of people just constantly puts pressure on us to stay ahead of the curve and to be successful in our jobs and be thinking about where are we going with our careers. And that that makes for a really tough environment. Interesting. It's, let's let's stay on this with um, just the, the leadership role of AI and technology. And we think of the tippy top. I'm just going to throw it out there. They're people too. The, the people at the top, they are human beings. I don't think when Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook, they would have to be dealing with all of this. Um, but, you know, let's let's have that conversation. If you're at the top of a company like big tech right now or big oil or something that's uh, – contributing to climate change when you think of responsibility and ethics and compliance like how do you stop the spread of corruption of detriment to our environment um, and still maintain a profitable organization 
I would argue that, you know, probably Mark Zuckerberg, when he started Facebook, he, he had no idea how much of a social impact it was going to have. And I'm sure it's been quite a learning curve for him and for so many other leaders like, like you're mentioning. Um, I, the times are changing for business leaders. You know, in, years ago, you would start a business, extractive industries, whatever it happened to be. And you just chased hard after it to bring value to your shareholders. And we've seen in the last couple of years, business leaders are banding together to redefine the purpose of a corporation. And investors are putting pressure on companies to make sure that they're disclosing what their plans are to be environmentally and socially responsible. Those are huge movements in business. So I would imagine for you know leaders in the C-suite, they are driven people, they're, they're success-minded, they're visionaries, they're disciplined, they're hard-charging. Um, they also, more often than not, would say that if they're asked, are they committed to integrity, they would absolutely say yes. But the challenge is actually demonstrating that and living it out all the way through how you define what success is. And I think that's changing in the business world. The ESG movement is starting to put pressure on businesses, especially in like the extractive industries, to redefine what is it that we're doing and how do we not only succeed as a business, but how do we leave the world better than we found it? Um, so, so it's not an easy time to be at the top of an organization. I, I would say one of the most important things a leader can do is to surround themselves with people who are not yes people, people who are innovative thinkers, people who will tell them there's another way for us to do that. People who have a mindset that they need to be thinking about corporate responsibility at the same time that we're thinking about the bottom line. Um, and that, that doesn't happen as much as you might think it does. It's kind of natural for business leaders to surround themselves with other folks who think like they do, who define success in the way they do, that they need to hear it and see it differently. Are there other examples that you've seen on a smaller scale that when we we're trying to figure these out, we're trying to innovate, that we could look at a few examples and say, you know, let's we could try that. Well, there are lots of little examples that happen in small places in workplaces all the time, whether it's sitting down as managers with teams looking at uh, project goals and come and actually spending time brainstorming what does success look like on a very broad scale and how do we actually communicate more broadly how we're thinking and what we're thinking. On large scales, I think we're starting to see companies that um, are very intentionally thinking about their corporate footprint. So, so if one example is BP that has essentially redefined itself as a company and redefined what its purpose is and what its targets are having to do with sustainable energy and less so extractive, uh, you know, oil extraction because of their real commitment to making sure that they are speaking to environmental responsibility. So, you know, little ways and big ways, I think we're starting to see it happen more and more. And, and BP is an interesting example. I know they try to redefine themselves as beyond petroleum, uh, but they've just invested like double the amount of money into new, you know, uh, fracking facilities around the world, billions and billions of dollars into extracting more resources after this change, something we refer to as green washing uh, in this space. And, you know, I don't want to, again, say, hey, look, that's it's a, it's a free market. They can do whatever they want. Like, look, I'm just saying that's what I've read and that's what they've decided to do during a pandemic. And it doesn't sit right with a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. Um is when it comes to the environment for leaders uh, and especially environmental leaders, do, is there a benefit in incorporating that purpose, that mission and that influ uh, you know, those values to attract a generation of like-minded thinkers? Sure. Absolutely. I think we're seeing more and more that people who are entering the workforce, it used to be that in job interviews, it was the employer asking employees about their values and about what's most important to them and how do they define success. And from an ethics perspective, trying to figure out 
are they the right fit for our company? But what we're seeing now, I mean, that still happens in job interviews. If you're getting ready to interview, that's a question you'll probably be asked. And if you're not, you don't want to work for that company. But more and more candidates are coming to interviews and asking companies, what are your values? How do you define success? What is it going to look like in this company 10 years from now? What's your culture like? Because in com potential employees are looking to see, is this culture going to be the right fit for me? Mm -hmm. um, and that that's critical. I mean, we know that 80% of employees who leave a workplace do so because of a toxic culture. So that fit, that commitment to values, to culture for both the company and for a potential employee is huge. Uh, when it comes to global organizations too, like I, I know we've talked about what are some universal values for a company like BP, who's everywhere around the world, is, do they find it uh, valuable to keep the same values and same mission in, let's say, America versus a um, uh, place in the North, Northern Africa or middle of the Middle East? Sure. Yeah, actually, they do. And we don't necessarily have to pick on BP the entire time. But <laughs> I, do, you know, I do know that ECI, uh, that ECI in the past has done some work with BP around their values. They, they recommitted to their values after the Gulf oil spill and took on a huge initiative to make sure that they um, communicated them to employees, that they got employee input on them. Um, they, they have circulated definitions of those values, but more importantly, and I think this is something that you see in a lot of global organizations, um, it's, it's possible to have one set of values and roll it out all across a global company, but the way people live it out in different parts of the world looks very different. So you have to allow room for that. Mm -hmm. um, so not only BP, but we could talk about other multinationals, but they they have a code of conduct, they'll have a set of universal values that they're trying to promote across the company, but then they'll invite managers, employees to come up with examples of those values integrated into training in different ways. And that, I think, it demonstrates demonstrates respect for people around the world that your company is committed to a certain standard for integrity, but they also recognize that culture makes a difference, geography makes a difference, mm -hmm. uh, the way you see the world. There's diversity in the workforce. Would you say it's a more of a cultural barrier? Is it a language barrier? Uh, what are some of the constraints that these leaders who are uh, running these multinational organizations run into? In terms of culture, you mean, or just in general, the, the barriers? That they the face. values, making sure the culture is a culture that is almost identical to the one that's in a different location. Well, I think some of it is just the sheer size of global operations. It's, it's easy to communicate a set of core values, print them up on posters and put them on the walls but it's another thing to integrate it <clears throat> into daily conversation and to make sure that as a leader yourself, it's a part of your daily conversation. That's surprisingly hard to do when you're spending your days talking with employees about all kinds of other challenges that come up in the workplace. Um, so, so part of the challenge at the top of an organization is to get the buy-in of managers in the middle of the organization and first-line supervisors, because those folks are also really essential to helping to communicate what those values are, to make them real in different parts of the organization, to tweak them or to speak about them differently in different parts of the geographic locations of your operations. So at the top, you're very dependent upon what's happening throughout your company. And that is always a challenge to make sure that you're communicating that expectation to management everywhere that this, this should be happening on a daily basis. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Uh, now what's the, Doc, what, I'm just curious, like what, what's the culture you want to work for? Uh, well, I, I, I work in a culture that I want to work for, which is, I think, one of the greatest blessings of my job. But um, I, I always appreciate that at ECI and I am drawn to organizations where people have a shared sense of what their mission is. 
they have a shared idea about the kind of impact that they want to have. Um, but you know, in, especially in recent years, one of the things that I appreciate about ECI, but I also know is so critical to other organizations is that they are respectful of each other, that respect is a, a key value, not only for um, respect for the organization, respect for authority, but just respect for each other as human beings. Mm. And I, I do get the opportunity to walk into other organizations and meet CEOs and meet senior leaders. And you know, within the first minute of meeting a CEO who is just genuinely committed to the mission and the values, genuinely respects people, it's it's obvious from the get-go that that is a human being that sees others in that workplace as a human being. And I think that makes a big difference. Doc, what is genuine? What is being real? What is bringing your full authentic self to work mean to you? Well, I think it means being being your whole person, I, you know, it's always hard as a leader and as a manager because you don't want to bring all your stuff to the workplace. You want to maintain some kind of privacy. And I don't think being genuine means you have to air everything in the workplace every day. But I, I do think that authentic and genuine leaders are the kinds of people who talk about their decisions and explain the thought process behind them. They explain why, how they arrived at decisions, why we're doing things the way we are. They do share something of their, just their own humanness, their own flaws. But the other thing I think that is a big part of being genuine is admitting when you make mistakes and talking about what you've learned from them because other people actually tune right into that um, and they learn from that. That's a huge influence on people's thoughts about how much do you as a leader really care about your employees. So are you suggesting also that maybe if a leader is expressing their flaws, expressing, expressing their wrongdoings, expressing their wrong decisions, being open, transparent, taking accountability mm -hmm. for uh, what they've done wrong, potentially that would inspire a culture of, of maybe more realness, more genuineness, more ownership. Absolutely. <clears throat> and there are examples of companies that actually will dedicate time to allowing employees to sit together and managers lead the way. And they talk about mistakes they've made or lessons they've learned, and they do a little post-mortem on them so that it encourages other people to feel that they can admit their mistakes too. I mean, innovation most often comes from making mistakes from trial and error and learning from them and improving as a result of it. So if you if you genuinely want to have a culture where people are thinking innovatively, but also where they're just gonna be honest with you if there are issues that need to be addressed, that's a huge first step is to actually model that contact, that conduct with your own employees. Doc, you've, you've thrown out some different stereotypes today. Um, you know, people that are more reserved, uh, mm -hmm. people, you know, introverts, extroverts. Uh, when it comes to the perspective and the emotional intelligence of a leader, how does one have to change their perspective in order to relate to different problems that people may have, i.e., let's talk about vulnerability for a second. I'm in a discussion panel about vulnerability and I'm learning a lot and it's predominantly females in this group and they're expressing as a female, I feel this way. I think it's a weakness to share what I actually want to say, whereas a male can share what they say and not get penalized for it. Bam, never even thought about it. How do leaders change their perspective or be more in tune to uh, different perspectives in the organization? Well, I would say actually a big piece of it is doing exactly what you're doing, being a, educating yourself and being a part of conversations, <clears throat> excuse me, it's allergy season in Virginia, being a part <laughs> of conversations with people of different perspectives so that they can tell you how they see the world differently or how they experience it differently. Um, and and reading reading books. So there are some classic books out there on, you know, differences in gender and differences in generation and, you know, differences in leadership styles and emotional, you know, emotional intelligence and how it affects different people's leadership. But I also think, you know, so part of it is, 
telling yourself that, first of all, making mistakes is an opportunity to learn, listening to other people, learning what their perspectives are, challenging them to tell you when you're doing something that you could be doing differently to be more effective. Um, and, and I think that that's a big piece of evolving in your own growth as a leader and as an influencer. I mean, we're, we're sort of we're living in a time where you can put any thought you have out there in social media and people will follow it. Some will like it. Some won't. Some will share it. Some won't. And what that the danger of that <clears throat> is that we're not getting good feedback all the time. Sometimes it's really harsh. But we're not having meaningful conversations with each other about how can I understand you better and what has been your journey in life that has brought you to the place where you are and what are the things that I do that I may not even be aware I'm doing that make you feel marginalized or less important or less valued. So good old fashioned, honest dialogue, you know, listening to others when they tell you about themselves is a pretty important thing. Is it more of a danger to just collect feedback and not do anything about it than just collect it at all? Like, I mean, think about it. Like if you do a big survey and you ask people for their feedback and they give it to you and you don't make any changes, are you kind of putting yourself at risk when you do that? Yes, absolutely. You know, the other thing that we have often told business leaders is that if you have a code of conduct in your organization and you've printed it up on nice posters and put it all everywhere in the organization, and you're not doing anything to actually talk about it or hold people accountable to it, it's actually worse to have a code of conduct than it is to not have anything at all. And the same is true for asking feedback. So if you're going to go out to your employees whether it's focus groups or casual conversation or a survey effort to assess your culture, don't do it unless you're, you want, you're prepared to actually take action on the feedback. Doesn't mean you have to listen to every piece of feedback and, and, you know, because that's often sort of an overwhelming task, but you will hear themes coming from employees and it's really critical to tell employees what you've heard, tell them what you're going to do differently um, to share with them personally what you've learned and what you're thinking about how you can change your own leadership style. But to not do anything, it, you'll never have a successful survey effort again in the future. Might be a little overstated, but people won't be as eager to take surveys. But they also just feel like, why are you asking my opinion if you don't really care about changing? Right. Interesting. And a lot of the business owners we've, we've had in this show they really do listen. I think a couple of the the poster childs that stick out to me are like Patagonia, uh, we got Eat the Change on, which is Seth Goldman's company, Honesty. And mm -hmm. I think what really resonated for them in a lot of the their conversations is when they see their brand having influence outside their organization. And so I know I asked you about, you know, what are some of the things that you should notice, the indicators that you should notice your culture might be self-destructing. What are some of the indicators that business leaders should pick up on that their culture and their values are in the right place? Well, I think you, it, it shows up in lots of different ways. It shows up in employee pride. I mean, employees are really proud to work for those kinds of organizations, not only for the products they make, but for the mission that they serve, because it's bigger than a product. It's about social change and belonging and community. And you hear it in the way employees talk to each other about the work they're doing. You hear it from customers. Um, but you also, I mean, to get back to some of the traditional metrics that companies are constantly, you know, trying to monitor to see if they're having issues, you'll also see more employees coming forward to tell you about problems because they feel comfortable doing that. They feel like they're in a workplace where their voice will be heard and there will be follow up. Um, you'll also hear employees talking about staying with the organization longer. Um, when you ask them questions like, do you believe our management is committed to integrity as a part of the way we define success? They'll say yes to that question. Um, mm -hmm. so, so there are both informal and formal ways. On the flip side, there are when companies have big problems, when big scandals happen, oftentimes the first thing you'll hear leaders talk about is that 
employees don't want to wear the logo in their clothing anymore, or they don't want to identify what company they work for mm-hmm. on LinkedIn and in their profiles, they take their affiliation out of it because it's hard to be proud of a company that you feel like has lost its way. Mm-hmm. And their social, I mean, there's a social impact for that too. The public tends to punish companies that have had scandals and it's tough to be in, aligned with that. Absolutely. And you're spot on. And I, I heard a great quote the other day from another guest. He's like, you know, trust is built or built on a bike and leaves on a Ferrari. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, it, it takes forever to build that trust and one thing happens and they're gone. And so when it comes to cancel culture, like how important, like what is the business case for values, integrity within your organization? Because I mean, we're seeing things that are unprecedented that we've never seen before based on a knee jerk reaction. What are some of the things that people can do to prepare for this new age of uh, public discrimination? Well, values, a company's values are really helpful on a lot of levels. But one of the reasons that they're really helpful is that it gives your employees a common language to talk about why certain things are problematic. So if, say, for example, as I was saying before, respect is a value that I think is pretty critical that every organization should have as a core value. If you have that as a core value, you make it part of the conversation when people are talking about how do we want to be treating each other. Then when something happens, employees have a term, they have a way, they have something, a common language to come forward and say, we are, I am not being respected in this workplace, or I'm seeing others not being respected in this workplace. Um, and so that's, it's a really important way that companies can sort of prepare their employees, but also just set the tone. This is how we're going to be. This is how we want to be treating each other. This is what it looks like to respect each other. Um, so that that's where a lot of companies have core values, but they haven't really made them real and vibrant. They haven't integrated them into the DNA of the way the company is working. And they're missing out on a real opportunity because I think you can walk into those companies where the values are real, where the values are evident, where people really care about them. And you can see the difference in their productivity, but also in their satisfaction with each other, but also in the extent to which they feel like they work in a place where they're valued. Interesting. And that makes a lot of sense. And so if I think about the leader of an organization and with, you know, leadership becomes responsibility, right? Obviously, if I were to make, let's say, if I have a a culture of one of um, uh, people are flawed, Uh, we're an authentic organization, we're genuine, people make mistakes, and we're going to take accountability for those mistakes. If something comes out about me as a leader of organization, a racist remark, something I wore for a Halloween party uh, during high school, and I get publicly shamed as an organization, is it smart to let myself go, remove myself from the company to not damage its image? Or how would you deal or react to a situation like that? Well, I would advise a company or a person in that situation, what what I would say is smart is to have a meaningful conversation with the leadership of the organization about what's best, what's best for the business, what's best for the community. In some cases, it's best to stick it out because, you know, the company makes a decision that that is something that they think is doable, they think is best for the well-being of the organization and its stakeholders, and frankly, for the leader involved. But in lots of other cases, the leadership will have a meaningful conversation with that person and say, we think it's best that you step out. Um, It's the thing about being a leader in a business. It's easy to start thinking that you're the person responsible for making all the decisions you alone. And if you can sort of get yourself into a mindset where you're, you sort of insulate yourself from thinking about you are one person who is a steward of a larger organization, accountable to presumably a board, accountable to your customers, accountable to your shareholders if you're a public company. And so in those moments where you've gone astray, it's time to make sure you're accountable to those people and to ask for their input in making those kinds of decisions, as opposed to just saying, this is my decision. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care of me. Right, right. And having those conversations in advance, like we're having now, right. 
I think would also be helpful. Is there a specific value doc that you would say an organization can incorporate today that would position their organization to be the most risk averse if something like cancel culture were to happen to them? Well, I still go back to my respect value, but I would also actually add into that um, honesty because you know, and you could, some companies will say transparency as opposed to honesty. And you can, we could talk all day about, are those the same thing? But cancel culture, the thing about cancel culture is it's so swift and it's, it can be so harsh, but part of the reason it happens is that people who are involved, people who have overstepped have opted to not either not speak at all, or people don't believe they're telling the truth. Um, and so, again, tr it, that kind of trust when you're in you're in a crisis, it's not like you're going to bear all the all the details immediately because there's lots of factors that go into that. But if over time before a problem happens, you've built up the trust of your stakeholders because you have been an honest person, because you have tried to be transparent, because you have respected others in the workplace. It pays off when those kinds of problems happen because even if your hands are tied and you're not able to share information, you're not able to speak into the situation, people are a little more likely to give you some room because you've earned it, because mm -hmm. you have shown them your character before a problem happened. Reputation. Okay, mm -hmm. so reputation Absolutely. is key. Doc, you've talked and expressed and stressed honesty, respect, integrity, transparency let's bring this home now doc what is your definition of a real leader well, a real leader great question um someone who is has a real commitment to the purpose of the organization that they're leading someone who is genuinely committed to the people that are engaged in that organization employees shareholders, stakeholders, board members, all the, and recognizes their impact on those other people's lives. And then with humility moves forward. So I, you know, I tend to think of true leaders as people, they are visionaries. They're often great speakers. They are sometimes charismatic people, but they are equally, there are equally many who are super quiet introverts, but what they have in common is a genuine commitment to the mission of their organization, a genuine commitment to the people who help them carry that out. Um, and a true leader is somebody who has a strong sense of personal values and a commitment to integrity. Well said, Doc. I appreciate you coming on this show. I'm so thrilled to have you on. I knew it would be a conversation when you had a and Socrates <laughs> showed up today uh, for Dr. Pat Harned. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, commit to the purpose, be authentic, have humility, and always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks.